Welcome to Dotnet 21. I gotta say, I'm super happy to participate for another year in this amazing conference with all these tracks and superb speakers. I've been taking a look to the schedule and this year we have a very diverse set of technologies and it's gonna be great. Knowing that all the fans raised in this edition will be used to finance the schooling of 60 children in Denver, in Senegal, makes this event even greater. Today, I'm going to talk about ahead of time compilation or what is the same, being able to compile our .NET applications into native code. I do not consider myself an expert in this area, but I've been following the core RT for quite a long time because I do really think that being able to compile our workloads into native code will be a game changer, allowing .NET to compete with other compiler languages that use a garbage collector like uh, Golang. I've been working with .NET since 2008, and my three wishes at the time were having a blazing fast platform to develop uh, applications, uh, being able to deploy all these applications in Windows and Linux, and being able to compile my applications to native code. So it looks like all of them have become true. We have right now an open source modular and blazing fast platform. We can uh, deploy our workloads into Mac OS, uh, Linux and Windows. And native compilation uh, is still a work in progress, but to be honest, it looks very promising. First of all, thank you very much to the organization to Fundación Goma Espuma for cooperating with uh, Plain Concepts in this uh, amazing initiative and also to all the sponsors that are collaborating with .NET 21. Let me uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Carlos Landeras. I work as a general manager at Plain Concepts. Now I consider myself a cloud and new technologies passionate that has been working with Microsoft technologies uh, since 2008 and I've been working at Plain Concepts for five years now. Allow me to do a brief introduction of the agenda of the, all the stuff that we are uh, seeing today. First of all, we are going to do a little introduction to ahead of time compilation to understand uh, what all these building blocks uh, allow us uh, to do. Okay. Then we're going to, to, to talk a little bit about the scenarios that are enabled for us once we introduce this AOT done at runtime into our applications. Obviously, to understand what the ahead of time compilation is, we have to compare it with just in time compilation. Let's talk a little bit of both of them and about uh, the main difference uh, uh, that we can see when, when working with one or another. We are also going to talk a little bit about the start time and performance that we gain when using this uh, AOT compiler. And then, uh, after that, everything are going to be demos and show me the code uh, sections. Okay, so we are going to see how to compile our applications, console applications, web app applications to, to, na to na into native code. We are going to, to take a look to cross-architecture compilation, so that means we are going to build our applications and run them on, on Windows. And then I'll move uh, myself into WSL2 that is my Linux uh, sandbox in, in this machine, and we are going to compile and execute all these applications in a, in a Linux machine. After that, obviously, uh, we are going to take a look into what are the benefits of using these compiled applications with Docker. As you might imagine, you don't even need the runtime to be able to execute this native code and in containers like uh, Ubuntu and all, all this kind of, of stuff. Okay. And then the latest demo is going to be a little bit of intro uh, uh, with uh, Rust. Okay, I'm going to show you how something that some years ago was very cumbersome, like being able to invoke uh, C sharp uh, assemblies or libraries from other languages like C++ required us to use COM or to use, uh, let's say, grabber libraries. But right now, thanks to this uh, AOT compilation, we are going to be able to execute our C sharp code from Rust in a very simple way. Okay, so let's do a brief introduction to the native compilation. Okay, the native uh, ahead of time .NET runtime can compile .NET uh, applications into a native single file executable and it can improve the starting time and performance. It can also produce standalone dynamic and static libraries that can be consumed by applications written in other programming languages. 
like we were saying, Rust or C++. We have a demo about this, and I think it's quite interesting. And also, it allows us to do cross-compilation. There are dedicated Nugget feeds to compile in Linux, Mac OS, and Windows X64. Okay? We, can, uh, we cannot compile Linux uh, artifacts or Linux assemblies while we're, uh, for example, working on, on Windows, that's not uh, supported yet, but we can move our source code into a target machine and compile, for example, in Linux. The most interesting scenarios, and we are going to take a look into them in, 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 in this session, are, for example, copying a single file executable from one machine and run on another of the same kind and architecture without the need of installing a .NET runtime. Another one would be creating and running a Docker image that contains a single file executable. So that means one file in addition to Ubuntu. We don't need to install the runtime. We don't need to install anything else. Compiling CSR libraries into dynamic or static uh, libraries is also very interesting and they can be consumed by other languages like CSR or REST. Okay, so let's take a look, uh, at, let's take a look uh, to JIT uh, versus a ahead of time compilation. Okay, JIT stands for just in time compilation. So that means when the CSR compiler or Visual Basic or uh, FSR compiler compiles our source code, it, genera it generates IL assemblies, okay? So that means our code is uh, bundled or compiled into the common intermediate language, also, also known as SEAL, in a bytecode uh, way. Okay, and SEAL is a CPU-independent set of instructions that can be converted to native code. So the once we compile uh, our apl .NET applications into MCL, uh, our application on the, our assembly's contents are split into categories. One would be the code of our application, another one would be all the metadata associated uh, to uh, our application, like the code, the type, the, the base classes, the interfaces, the methods, the fields, and etc. Uh, one, once we execute the .NET application, the runtime converts the MCL code into native code, as you can see here on the right. We can move our assemblies from one system to another once they are compiled into SEAL uh, or MCL uh, uh, bytecode. And then when the uh, application is started, the JIT compiler, uh, let's say, JITs all that code uh, on the fly to native code so it can be executed by our machine. Uh, Just-in-time compilation obviously have some benefits, but also have uh, some drawbacks. Okay, some of the benefits would be that uh, this intermediate uh, code is independent of the hardware or the operating system the code, the code will run on. Because obviously, when you start application, it, the code, your code gets jitted and it's automatically transformed to native code. And it has a great version resilience, because obviously this language is like a high-level intermediate language that uh, almost specifies what our code is doing, like execute method X on class uh, C. It's very abstract and very uh, high level. And talking a little bit about the drawbacks, we can say the runtime needs type loading step to compute the information that is necessary to execute the program. A lot of things need to happen before the runtime actually executes our first line of code. And also, uh, all the data structures uh, from our program are not fully optimized like in other native compiled languages. When we talk uh, about ahead of time compilation, we can say uh, AOT emits platform specific native code. So that means if we compile for Windows, we compile for Windows. We cannot move that executable to Linux because obviously it won't work. We need to go to Linux and compile our source code in that platform. We can also run self-contained native executables without installing the .NET runtime in the operative system. And once this happens, obviously, our program is as hard to decompile as a C++ native executable. Uh, reverse engineering tools like Reflector no longer works. Uh, ahead of time also has uh, some benefits, but also uh, we can find some drawbacks. Between the benefits, we can uh, take a look to an improved performance and reduce the startup time, as we do not have to execute all the, pre the preliminary JIT compiler steps before running our code. 
and obviously we can uh, optimize our application to have a smaller combination output sizes or prefer for example increase the speed of the assemblies uh, uh, prioritizing that to the output size of the of the assemblies some of the most important drawbacks are uh, the lack of support for the dynamic loading like using for example assembly uh, load file on and the lack of support for runtime code generation we cannot use for example system reflection I mean, to generate code on the fly. This is obviously because the, uh, the .NET ahead of time runtime compiler uh, has to take a look to all the types uh, that are included in our program and uh, the linker strips out all the code that is not necessary to have these amazing compilation output sizes. The problem is when we work with reflection it's very very hard for the compiler to understand what types, methods, fields will be used from uh, types that are uh, loaded dynamically. Okay, so these reflection based assemblies can force us to declare assembly directives to help the compiler find types that should be analyzed. We can create XML files and declare uh, what assemblies we want to be allowed to use uh, dynamic loading so they are not, let's say, stripped out by the linker from the, from the final native application. Here we have some interesting pictures that come uh, directly from Microsoft, from uh, Strahovski in this case. You can see the first, uh, the first picture. Uh, let us see what's the startup time on ASP.NET depending on the runtime uh, the application gets compiled. So you can see, for example, the startup time of Core RT, that would be the AOG, the ahead of time compilation, is much lower than uh, the startup time for traditional Core CLR uh, execution. Okay. Also, the time to first instruction uh, is very, very low when using Core RT. The time to first instruction would be, for example, when our web server is ready uh, to start serving requests, when we are working with desktop applications, when our desktop application gets presented to the user. And uh, another interesting thing is the size of uh, the Core RT uh, Hello World size, as you can see on the right. We can have a Hello World uh, com natively compiled application with 5 megabytes of size. Okay. Obviously, when we talk uh, about the startup time, uh, probably it's going to be much more interesting uh, measuring this startup time in applications that are, for example, desktop applications. Our users will like to start using the application as soon as possible instead of having this loading or this spinner while everything is, is loading. And uh, it would be less impactful in some other applications like web servers, because obviously web server is a long term or a long running application, and it's not so important uh, the time uh, it takes to start. Okay. So right now we are going to move uh, uh, ourselves to the code. Uh, these are the demos that we are going to see uh, in a moment. One would be compiling with native uh, ahead of time. The other one would be compile applications in, in Linux, for example. Then we will move into ahead of time compilation plus Docker. And then we are going to play a little bit with interop and rest. So let's go to Visual Studio and start coding a little bit. Okay, I am in a empty program CS application. There's, this is a uh, web SDK project that is empty and let's start writing some code. First of all, I'm going to create a very simple web application that serves some content in, uh, in the given path uh, because the most interesting thing here is uh, understanding how we can compile this application into native code. Okay, so let's uh, configure our web host. For example, we are going to configure our app to use routine and probably we are going to map uh, for example one path with a map uh, get uh, use, sorry, use endpoints uh, config and let's configure some get method maybe on uh, hello okay And here we are going to return some kind of response. Probably 
As I'm uh, using uh, the top level statements, uh, right now I have to declare the class underneath, let's, I don't know, declare something like a user service. It's going to have, it's going to have a, a salute method to stream, I don't know, user. Let's say return uh, hello, Mr. Mrs. Uh, user. Okay. I'm going to register this in the container configure services uh, services dot add single term of user service okay and here let's get the service from the service provider, so that would be context or rate services, uh, get required say or base of uh, user service. And for example, let's try to read the username uh, by in the query string. For example, that would be username is um, context uh, request uh, query um, user or name, for example, first of default. And then uh, let's write into the response the result from our service. That would be service salute username. Okay. Perfect. And then uh, let's try to measure a little bit the startup time until um, our application is ready according to the uh, ASP.NET SDK. For example, we can create a stopwatch and starting uh, as soon as the application starts, the program CS starts running. And then, for example, here, I'm going to declare a callback to the host lifetime. That would be a app application services get where set risk for if host application lifetime. And then we are going to register callback when for an application started event okay <clears throat> so this is an action that we can that will be uh, called by uh, by ASP.NET whenever the application has started and then we are going to write the amount of time it took the wrong time to reach this part okay so that would be something like elapsed time and then uh, st elapsed and total milliseconds Okay, we are going to print in the console the total milliseconds that took uh, to the runtime and to SP.NET uh, since we started the stopwatch here until the application started. Okay, so I think we are ready to go. Let's give this a try. And on the run, let's release. See if this runs. Okay. Hello. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry for that. Obviously, I need to build and run. Otherwise, our application is doing nothing. Okay. So let's run the application again. It took. 456 milliseconds to host to, to trigger our application started callback. Let's see if this is running. Curl HTTP localhost 500. Uh, hello, uh, name uh, dotnet21. Hello, Mr. Mrs. dotnet21. Okay, it looks like this is running. So, right now, uh, we are going to compile our application into native code. Okay, the only thing we need to do is add in a package. That is called Microsoft.NET IL compiler with the pre-release parameter because there's no final version yet. This is a work in progress. Okay. Something that you need to take into account uh, for this work has been added is that this um, <coughs> this package is in the .NET experimental Nagit feed. Okay, it's not available in Nagit yet, so you should go to the Nagit package explorer. And as you can see, I have it here. This is the Donut Experimental that is under this repository feed. 
you can find it in the .NET Core T repository, all the information required to, to use this, this package. And it, this is very, very simple. Once you have this package reference inside your um, up in your uh, project file, you only need to do a publish where you need to specify, obviously, the platform uh, we are compiling for. In this case, it's uh, uh, Windows uh, 64, okay? And the configuration in this case is going to be released. Allow me to add an, a parameter to put this in the native folder, so I don't have to be uh, going all the time to the bin folder. And obviously, the compilation of the web API into native code is going to take, to take uh, more time than the regular uh, execution of the uh, or publishing uh, with the core CLR. Okay, because obviously, the .NET uh, the, the core RT uh, uh, compiler has to do much more work uh, to compile into native code than to compile to MCL or the common intermediate language. Okay, we can see this, uh, this phrase here, generating compatible uh, native code to optimize the assembly. Uh, seeing all these warnings is somehow normal because they're probably uh, some, some warnings that come from the use of reflection inside some of these assemblies, but that doesn't uh, necessarily mean that we are going to have any kind of problem. Okay, so let's compile the application. It's going to take a little bit more, but our library has already been created. So if we move to the native folder and we open the explorer here, you're going to see that we have right now uh, an application here that is called Web, Web API XA, and there's no much more. The other things are the Nugget config, the web configuration, and the symbols. Okay, so we have uh, right now the Web API uh, XA global in place. Okay, uh, if we run again the server, sorry, we need to go one folder up. It looked like uh, 450 milliseconds, in this case 404 was the time uh, elapsed until our, our application started. Let's see, let's see how uh, our native application behaves uh, once it has been compiled into native. Okay, as you can see, it's only 157. Our executable is, uh, executable is considerably faster. Let's execute it again. As you can see the times are much lower to for our application to get started. Okay, so right now let's move uh, uh, to play a little bit with Docker, okay? It would be very, very interesting, obviously, uh, moving or compiling this application inside a Docker image and having to install nothing uh, related to the SDK or the, or the runtime, okay? So I have put in place and published into the Docker hub an image that is quite simple, okay? It's an image based on Ubuntu 20, and I just install some tooling, in this case, the CLAN compiler, just in case I, I want to compile something. In this case, our application is already compiled. Curl to test the web server. And this would be the mandatory, uh, the three mandatory packages that we need to have in Ubuntu installed. So our compiled na native applications uh, can run. Okay, .NET has a requirement of this Curveverse library. The Levico is a library that is related to Localis and Unicode support. And this, uh, the Sidlib is one of the other um, dependencies that .NET uh, has to, to work in, in Ubuntu. Okay, so right now, I'm gonna move to the cross-compilation demo. I'm going to start working with my WSL Linux box. Okay, I have installed the uh, Ubuntu distribution uh, in under WSL2. And what I'm going to do is compile this application into a Linux native executable. Okay, for that, obviously, we need to add a new uh, runtime package. And as I am not going to be using um, Visual Studio anymore in WSL, it's going to be able to download the packages because I have this Nugget config in place with the .NET experimental feed configured. Okay, so let's add the package for Linux runtime. The name of this package is runtime.linux.x64.microsoft.net IL compiler pre-release. Pre-release. 
let's add this package reference. Okay, let's see if it uh, has been added to the project. It looks like that. And right now, <clears throat> let's compile the uh, Linux uh, native uh, executable, doing exactly the same thing we did before. We configure the platform to be Linux x64 in a release configuration in the native output folder. <clears throat> okay, sometimes, uh, pr pr probably because my WSL have some memory constraints, I configure the, the Linux uh, box to have 6 gigabytes, take quite a long time to compile this. Obviously, in a, in a, Linux, in a real Linux machine, it would be uh, less time, but right now, might be like one minute or something like that. I'm gonna move this terminal into WSL as well, just in case I need to execute something against uh, the web uh, server. Looks like taking some time. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do once this uh, application gets compiled is uh, executing it in, in Linux, of course, and then we're going to move uh, the compiled application into a Docker container so we can see how we can uh, actually execute uh, the application without having to install the SDK or the runtime or all these uh, packages that we obviously have to install when we are executing with the core CLR. Okay, it took quite a long time, but it looks like the the native uh, binary has been emitted right now. And let's see if I can execute it. This would be my web API, and is running. Okay, so <coughs> let's uh, execute this in uh, in background. Okay, and let's curl to see if this is working. Curl. Localhost 500, hello, name, Carlos, and it looks like it's working, okay? Let me... Let me kill the application and execute this, the, the binary, without emitting any kind of log, because otherwise we can see the curl output. Let's put any to the no, dev null. Okay, and let's call it again. Okay, yeah, it's working perfect. Okay, so right now, uh, seeing that the uh, web server is, is working, let's move this binary into a Docker container. Okay, we're going to start a Docker uh, container with the image uh, I've shown previously. Okay, so in, in an interactive mode, I'm gonna run uh, Carlos Landeras uh, slash uh, Ubuntu. AOT to get a bash cell once the container is started. Okay, we are here. And then we are going to move the binary into uh, this uh, server, into this container, sorry. As you can see, there's no .NET. .NET hasn't been installed. We can really, we cannot uh, execute .NET applications, but what we are doing right now is obviously copying and already uh, natively compile a uh, binary. Okay, so let's do a docker copy of um, our native uh, web API into this container in the root path. Okay, this should be here already and we should be able to run this web API without the runtime or the SDK. And as you can see, our server it's running again let's curl the container inside docker to see that everything is working and it looks like it's working 200 response okay so as you can see it's very very interesting doing all this kind of stuff because uh, compiling to native code is super, super, super easy to do, okay? Microsoft uh, 
only uh, requires us to add these uh, packages into our project file and you just need to do it on and publish uh, with the desired platform configuration and voila you have native code uh, compiled application that is ready to move into docker containers or from one machine to, uh, to another the only requirement is that you need to move the executable into the same uh, let's say architecture okay so if you compile Linux x64 you can move that uh, binary into other Linux x64 systems but if you want to use Mac OS you need to compile under that target uh, the source code so quite interesting right seeing the .NET uh, framework compiled into native code Right now we are going to move to the next demo that I also think that is quite interesting because uh, using ahead of time enable us to compile our .NET assemblies or .NET class libraries into static or static libraries that can be directly consumed by uh, other low-level languages like uh, C++ or REST. Okay, so let's move into this project, into this interrupt folder and we have a project called .NET Lib that as you can see it's a, it's a class library uh, targeted to uh, NET uh, 5.0 that uh, already has the Microsoft.NET compiler installed. What we are going to do right now is creating a library that uh, is going to expose two methods that we are going to consume from a Rust program. Okay, I have a little scaffolding in place. I have like a list of phrases that we are going to use in um, one of those methods, uh, famous, uh, celeb uh, phrases or famous phrases, and I have an, uh, an static random in place to be able to generate random numbers. So right now I'm going to use one of the latest uh, features that were uh, added to CSAR, that is the unmanned colors only, uh, where uh, the compiler is going to extern these methods and make them available to be consumed externally. Okay, so we are going to create a traditional um, Fibonacci function, okay, this is the entry point, uh, the, num the name we are going to have to use from REST and let's create the method, it's quite simple, public static imp uh, uh, Fibonacci imp number and then here, uh, if we want to use recursion, we are going to have to declare a different method because we cannot call uh, using recursion method that is decorated with the manage colors only because obviously is only allowed to be called uh, externally, not from uh, the program. So let's declare uh, an, uh, <coughs> a private method that is called uh, Fibonacci internal. We're going to receive a number and let's uh, implement the Fibonacci with recursion. If the number is zero, sorry, if the number is zero or the number is one, it will return the number. Otherwise, return a call, a recursive call with the uh, number minus one plus recursive call number minus zero. Okay, we have already declared one method that is the Fibonacci and let's create another one that would be uh, manage colors only uh, entry point and this is going to be famous phrase. Okay, famous phrase. Yeah, and this uh, method is going to uh, randomly return to user uh, one of these sentences and appending the name of the user. So in this case, obviously, because how we have to work with uh, Rust uh, FFI for inch uh, interfaces, we need to work with uh, pointers. We can really return a, a string. We, we need to work with, with pointers. Let's uh, declare the famous phrase and we are going to receive a pointer with the name of the person that is invoking this method. So let's uh, unmarcel this string using the pointer to string ANSI to actually get in the, the string value under the name pointer. Okay, and let's get a phrase by using the phrases collection and the random I have also in place. And let's get a phrase that, uh, whose mean value is zero and the, <clears throat> the maximum value is the number of phrases minus one. Okay. And then let's compose a message. This message is going to be, for example, hello, uh, who, and the phrase. Okay. And obviously, right now we have to return a pointer. So we can use, for example, uh, Marcel uh, string to global ANSI of this message. So with this, we are going to return a pointer. Okay. 
<coughs> quite interesting, right? We have a class library, we are exposed in some functionality, and we are going to consume this library from uh, Rust, okay? So let's move to the Rust project. Uh, first of all, obviously, we need to compile uh, this .NET lib, following the same steps we made previously, .NET uh, publish, etc., uh, etc. Et I have already done this, okay? So we don't have to wait again. So, and let's move to the Rust program, okay? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, if we have some time, I'm going to do the opposite demo that is calling uh, Rust from Cesar. That's pretty straightforward, thanks to the DLL, DLL import uh, uh, feature of Cesar. But uh, when you want to run a .NET application from Rust, you obviously need to uh, put some, uh, let's say, scaffolding or bootstrapping in place. Remember, uh, .NET has a, a, a garbage collector, and it also has uh, some other uh, building blocks that need to be running before our program. So we need to configure our Rust uh, application uh, to use some of the Windows uh, API uh, libraries like the Combase uh, API, the Wind User and Bcrypt. Uh, I found that I have to add this into this project just by reading to the errors. Uh, the linker couldn't find this library, so I, let's say, investigated how to include this, um, these uh, libraries into Rust uh, compiled application. And these are the three libraries we're going to need to be able to consume this. Uh, this CSR library, okay? Um, RAS has a, a special file that is called the VL, uh, VLD, uh, RS, where we need to tell the compiler what static or, or certain libraries we want to link into our program, okay? So in this case, take a look into this path. This path is where our runtime for Windows is located under my machine in the Nugget Packages folder, and uh, obviously you have different versions of the Nugget package. This is the one I want to use. And inside this SDK folder is where we can, we have the, um, the static libraries for the runtime and all the, the bootstrapping of the DLLs to load the garbage collector and all the stuff. Okay, so what I'm telling Rust with this uh, sentence is A, so Rust, search uh, for some native libraries under this location, okay? and also search under the lib uh, folder. As you can see, the lib folder is here, and I have the .NET lib compiled. Before going uh, further, uh, I obviously need to, to show you something that is important to compile uh, uh, the library, it's, sorry, to compile this application into a library, we need to use this, uh, this uh, MS build uh, property that is called native lib static, Obviously, you can also compile, compile into certain libraries. You have to use the self-contained true, okay? And the other stuff is pretty much the same you've seen previously, okay? So, uh, obviously, you can put this native lib static here inside a, inside a property group, but I've just uh, put here the script in the build file so you can take a look. Okay, so let's see how we can compile this. I said I, I wasn't gonna do it, but I think it's important because uh, it's a little bit different, right? So let's go to uh, Rust to Cesar. Let's go to uh, .NET and if we paste it here, you're going to see something that is interesting. The file that is emitted, in this case, is going to be a lib file, a static lib file. Okay. So if we go to the to native, we open the Explorer. You can see that. Uh, we have this lib file, and I copied this lib file and just moved it into this lib folder. Okay, so with this VLRS, we are telling uh, Rust, hey, load all the runtime, .NET runtime, garbage collector, and libraries from the SDK, then load everything that is under lib, that's the .NET lib, and then I specify exactly what libraries I want to uh, link uh, into the program. Okay, so it's the bootstrapper, the runtime, and uh, the .NET lib, okay? So right now, what we are going to do is uh, invoking our our program. Okay, first of all, I need to uh, I need to obviously extern the crate for Win API. Okay, so I uh, let's say all these uh, all these dependencies I was talking about before are linked in, into the program. And uh, once I've done this, let's declare a, f a, f a main function. Okay. And uh, we have to do almost uh, uh, almost the same that we would be doing in CSR, that is declaring 
what uh, we want to do. So let's link uh, the library uh, bootstrapper DLL, okay, uh, whose kind is a static library. Uh, let's link uh, the runtime, whose kind also is static. And now let's link our library, the one we have, uh, let's say, consumed, okay, sorry, created some minutes ago. That is the .NET lib, that is under the lib folder, that is also of kind static. Okay, and uh, this is obviously telling Rust that before using the .NET lib, it needs to link the bootstrapper DLL, that is the one that is going to start loading the runtime, the garbage collector, and all these uh, building blocks. And then we are going to stern the methods we want to use, that they were a Fibonacci. Sorry, Fibonacci. In this case, it receives an int uh, 32 and returns an int 32. And uh, the famous phrase, famous phrase, here in REST, you have to use as a C string, a C compatible string, as a constant that would be a C char. We have to import the C char from the uh, operating system row C char. Okay? And uh, obviously, it's going to return a pointer to a C char as well. Okay, so uh, let's see if this compiles and let's go with the implementation. Okay, it's looking good. Okay, right now, if we go to the main function, we are going to have to open an unsafe block because obviously we are going to be working with unsafe features. And let's try to invoke a Fibonacci, Fibonacci uh, 5, okay, and render the output into the screen. Fibonacci 1 is uh, Fibonacci 1 and okay let's uh, execute it again with uh, maybe number 34 34 and this is Fibonacci 2 and Fibonacci 2 is Fibonacci 2 <clears throat> let's see if this works okay character ran and voila voila we are consuming our CSR static library from Rust this is the result of the Fibonacci uh, function. Okay, so let's move now to use our famous phrase uh, uh, function. In this case, we have to use a string to be able to create a C compatible string. And I'm going to pass the name uh, Carlos. This returns a, a Rust result, so let's just and grab it because this is obviously a demo. Let's get a pointer from this string. So this is pretty straightforward in Rust, it's a pointer. And now let's call the, the method. Let's get, for example, two phrases, famous phrase, and I'm gonna pass the same name in both of them, the name Carlos, and the second phrase here. And right now, let's print the results of uh, this uh, famous phrase uh, call into the console. So this, in this case, we have to do the opposite. We have to load the C stream from a pointer, and the pointer would be the phrase one that is returning a, a cons a, a, a cons C char. Okay, and let's print the second one. Okay, we, remember what we have done here. Obviously, is loading uh, the dot the, the runtime. Okay, or the garbage collector, and then loading our library. And these two methods that are here are the ones that we have implemented here in the Fibonacci and the famous phrase. Okay, so let's see if this is working. Let's invoke uh, our program to see if the famous phrase is working. Cargo run and voila. Hello Carlos, try to be a rainbow in someone's cloud. Hello Carlos, happiness is like a kiss. Okay, as you can see this is amazing. If you have been working with this kind of interrupting in the past, you might remember that before we had to use com, uh, components or even uh, C++ library wrappers to be able to consume CSR libraries uh, uh, from these kind of languages. But right now, uh, apart from uh, this little ceremony, uh, it's quite simple to uh, consume CSR static libraries from languages like, like Rust. So I really hope you like this demo because when I was testing all this stuff, I was uh, quite excited. Uh, about these new capabilities. So uh, before going to the last demo, let me uh, tell you that as we have already linked the bootstrapper and the runtime here, we don't really need to specify them here. 
I put uh, these two lines on purpose so you can really understand the order and what's happened underneath. But if we remove these and we only uh, uh, leave the name of the dot and leaf that is the one that we are going to consume and we do cargo run, it will work uh, as well. Okay? So uh, another interesting uh, approach would be doing the opposite, right? Uh, having the dotnet consumer that is actually consuming um, a Rust library. So let's see to the Rust library I have created. Okay? I'm not going to write it uh, this time because obviously uh, it would take much more time. As you can see, I have a git request that is uh, actually using a library called request to call uh, the typical JSON placeholder with a user that is being passed uh, for each language like Caesar. Okay, we get the request. We uh, deserialize this user response to the, obviously this object where we get the ID, the name, the email. And we have the same representation, but uh, with a wrapper on C, C uh, language, because this is the one that is going to be uh, uh, sent to the to the foreign language. Okay, so what we do here is we get the result from the URL, where we deserialize to the user response. Okay, we create C strings for this result. Okay, and convert them into row. This uh, into row. Uh, uh, moves the ownership of this pointer to the C uh, color, okay? And what we need to do right now is having some static pointers uh, so the uh, strings remain alive until CSR uh, consumes them, okay? So we uh, point uh, the name pointer to the actual uh, name C string row pointer, the, e the email, uh, we do the same, and then we return this thread, okay? And I have created an, another method with free log because uh, once you emit a pointer uh, with into row, you need to use from row to lead to free that memory, okay, from uh, from the application from from the program, okay. And I also have some other methods like divide or fib Fibonacci as well, okay. But the most interesting would be this one that is actually calling to the to an external endpoint, okay. Uh, if we go to the .NET consumer, uh, as, as uh, we are going to compile this, uh, obviously, multi, in a multi-platform way, we can define uh, that we want to use uh, DLL um, when we are using uh, Windows and that we uh, want to use an SO file when we are using Linux. We tell Rust to compile this as a dynamic library by using this script type dialib. And uh, depending on the platform we are compiling for, we are going to get the DLL or an SO. Okay, this Windows uh, uh, conditional compiler tag is obviously is obviously declared here. What I'm doing is uh, declaring a constant Windows with when a condition with the, when the OS is Windows NT, and I am emitting the message when when we are b uh, before building. Uh, let's say explaining with uh, with under what platform we are compiling for. Okay, so uh, as you can see, the the program CS is quite straightforward if you have ever worked with uh, DLL import. This value will be the DLL or the SO depending if we are Linux on, or we are uh, on Windows and it's very pretty straightforward. I am iterating uh, in these four loop 10 times and I'm calling the get request, okay? This get request that returns a user. Obviously this uh, is a, a an structure I had to declare with the layout guy sequential that has the ID, the name, and the email. And we are calling, remember, we are calling to this method that we have here, that is the get request. Okay? So what we are doing here is we're calling the, the get request, we are getting the strings from the pointers, uh, name and email. We are declaring declaring free lock here. So the pointers are freed once we get the request and, and marshal the values. Uh, to actual strings and we log it in console and then we we execute like 10,000 times the divide and 20 times the Fibonacci, okay? The most interesting thing is obviously we are going to compile this into native and we are going to move it to Linux uh, and this is going to be quite awesome, okay? Because what we can do right now is we are going to move to this uh, interrupting folder that is uh, uh, CSR to rest, CSR to rest, okay, and then I'm going to compile the .NET consumer 
I think it's already in place. If it's already in place, I won't compile it again because I don't have that much time. But then I have the libras lib and I also have the .NET consumer. Both of them are, uh, let's say, compiled in Linux. Okay, so if I ran again docker exec, so okay, sorry, docker ran beyond slash it, uh, Carlos Landeras uh, Ubuntu AOT uh, vivas, I'm gonna copy uh, docker cp .NET consumer into this container. If we execute it, you're gonna see an error right now because it's going to look for the libraste so because obviously we are compiling in Linux and is unable to find the DLL. So let's copy the library that I uh, compiled with Rust, the lib Rust so to the container into the user lib folder. That is one that Ubuntu uses to load libraries. And then if I execute the .NET consumer, voila, our application is running. Okay, I am retrieving users from the internet, executing this Rust library. I'm also executing the divide and Fibonacci, but they are not being rendered into a stream. But the most important thing is I just started only one container uh, with Ubuntu and I moved both compiled native files. One is a native Rust library and the other one is a native Caesar program. And I'm able to uh, interrupt between the two languages without having to install anything else. So thank you very much for coming into this session. That was everything. I hope you enjoy it. I'm uh, quite excited about the future of uh, ahead of time uh, compiling .NET. Uh, I want to say thanks uh, to, to Plain Concepts, to Fundacion Gamma Spuma, Microsoft, Intellectia, my public inbox, Devs DNA, to everyone that collaborated with this amazing conference. And uh, see you soon.